Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Aaron Porras, and coming up in today's newscast, Israeli doctors and nurses are angry as their wages are cut during quarantine. Coronavirus restrictions for the upcoming holidays are published, and health ministry officials explain how the nation's sewage could help predict a second wave of the virus. Coronavirus infections are continuing to rise with over 14,300 people now diagnosed in the state of Israel. That's a rise of 443 infections over the last 24 hours alone, more than double the increase when compared to just a day earlier. Also, the health ministry says that at least 187 people are now passed away from COVID-19, and 148 are currently in serious condition, 111 of whom are on ventilators. But the positive news is that more than 4,960 Israelis have now recovered from this deadly virus. And the health ministry has now purchased 2.4 million serological tests for the coronavirus as well, which checks for antibodies in the blood, indicating whether or not a person has had COVID-19 and developed immunity to it. Studies have revealed that asymptomatic carriers could be spreading the disease without even knowing they're infected. And serological tests could help health officials determine what percentage of the population may have been infected. Then knowing this will help policymakers decide when and how to reopen the Israeli economy. But serological testing will first be carried out in the ultra-Orthodox city of Bnei Brak, followed by other communities with high rates of infection, and finally in factories and other places of work. This comes as nurses and doctors are protesting, however, over the fact that they are seeing a decrease in their latest salaries. And why? Because they've had to spend time in quarantine after coming into contact with infected patients. Quarantine is counted as sick days, which are counted at a reduced rate. And medical professionals say that they shouldn't also have to deal with any financial losses when exposure to the coronavirus has become an inevitable part of their job. Now, according to most reports, the Chinese government's attempt to cover up the coronavirus is largely responsible for the virus's current spread. But in spite of mounting evidence, Chinese government officials are trying to fight allegations that they are to blame. In fact, they're even going as far as blaming the West for spreading it to them. So how is this happening? Joining us to discuss is Dr. Ori Sela, head of the Department of East Asian Studies at Tel Aviv University. Thank you so much for being with us. Now, let's start talking about the source of the coronavirus. There are rumors about it being developed in Chinese government labs. There are other rumors about food markets in Wuhan. Uh, you know, what excuse is the Chinese government currently providing for the virus? Good afternoon. Um, first, I wouldn't use the term uh, excuses uh, because this issue is much more complex. Mm. Uh, what I would say is that uh, what we see now going on in the world is a battle of narratives over the question of the origin, over the question of how countries were or were not prepared for uh, such a, a, a pandemic, uh, as well as, uh, as to the actual measures taken by different countries. In time, we'll see these battles uh, raging over the exit strategies. So uh, as far as China is concerned, the different narratives that it manufactured or, or spread since, let's say, January um, were changing uh, over time. Mm -hmm. So for example, in January, the main issue for the Chinese government was to contain the rumors, what the Chinese government yeah, uh, saw as rumors. How it was and where it had come from. Yeah, the issue then was not the question of how effective it was. The, the issue was to, to contain in the narratives, in the media and the social media, to contain uh, the, the rumors that for the Chinese government were uh, conceived as dangerous and, uh, and as problematic. Later on, uh, when we moved from January to February, and as the Chinese government uh, saw that the pandemic is much more serious, then the, the narratives that uh, were coming from China were trying to uh, pinpoint the blame on the uh, local government rather than the central government. And later on, as China was uh, uh, beginning to uh, move uh, further uh, in its uh, exit strategy, so-called, in the middle and late February, um, then the issue was to show that China was actually handling it very well and that uh, the so-called China model for uh, coping with the virus was the most effective one, and hence also that the Chinese government model was the most effective one. Then in March, and as uh, media in the world uh, also began focusing on China and, uh, and accusing it for uh, the spread of the virus, then we saw uh, various uh, types of new narratives coming out of China 
uh, trying to actually uh, say well, that the virus came from the U.S., came from Italy, came from the U.S. Army, all right, all right, well, various types of uh, narratives. Well, speaking of the United States, we're seeing reports now that Missouri is trying to sue the Chinese government and specifically uh, the communist uh, uh, government of China, the Communist Party in China, for damages over this uh, over this virus. Uh, how do you think international relations with China are going to be affected uh, right now and in the future? Well, first of all, uh, here in Israel, we don't need to go as far as Missouri. Um, we we have this kind of uh, uh, of a lawsuit uh, in Herzliya, um, hmm. so uh, it's here as well. Um, uh, in, in any case, to your main question, the relationship between uh, mostly China and the U.S., these are the major powers that we're talking about, before the corona, were not, uh, they were not a happy cap couple. Uh, we saw the so-called trade war, then in December there were uh, news about the trade war mm -hmm. being over. It was not over. Uh, there was a treaty that was signed, but it, was, it didn't mean uh, too much. Sure. And in other words, what we see in the, uh, during the corona and, and what we will see in the post-corona is uh, the, the same trade war being exacerbated, being uh, magnified, um, but it will uh, still, in my opinion, will not be uh, something that uh, is uh, um, comparable to the um, Cold War or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. China and the U.S. are intimately integrated in, in economy, in relations, in very many ways. Right. So the, the question would be, how will they be able to get along? And right. for smaller countries, well, how to uh, maneuver themselves so that they don't get hit uh, when the storm uh, goes by. All right, Dr. Sela, thank you so much for joining us. Now, life under lockdown isn't easy for anyone. And in a controversial move, the Israeli government has already begun to ease coronavirus restrictions in efforts to keep the economy afloat. But for some, it's still not enough. Two top Haredi rabbis in Israel are now threatening drastic steps if yeshivas aren't opened soon. Israeli yeshivas, or Jewish ultra-Orthodox religious seminary schools, have served as major vector points for the coronavirus's spread. And now the ultra-Orthodox, or Haredi neighborhoods of Jerusalem and Bnei are among the hardest-hit communities by the virus. Still, the two rabbis, Kanievsky and Edelstein, who have hundreds of thousands of followers, say that the study halls must be reopened or else. And while they aren't elaborating on the threat, Many clashes with the police and health officials, sometimes even violent clashes, have already broken out over yeshiva and synagogue closures. Some Haredim are even donning yellow stars now, like those used in Hitler's Germany, in protest. Meanwhile, many secular Israeli parents and teachers are dealing with the schooling problems of their own. Parents and teachers alike are decrying distance learning programs as they've not been effective, and they're not equally accessible to all students either, especially with respect to households with several children and or lower income. Also, many parents at home are not able to work properly if all the computers are taken up. So the parents' committee has asked that summer vacation in July be canceled and that students return to class in the first few weeks of August as well. The teachers' union, on the other hand, says that it's already offered to extend the school year into summer vacation by nine days, but that the finance ministry is now taking advantage of them by taking away summer vacation at the teachers' expense. In related news, while trade in public spaces is having difficulty recovering, there has been 250% growth in the volume of remote transactions by Israelis. So what are Israelis buying from isolation, and how can small businesses cash in? Dr. Vili Abraham, ILTV contributor and consumer behavior expert, joins us with the answers. Doctor, thank you for joining us. Now, what are Israelis buying right now? Because, you know, Israelis typically buy online a lot anyway, so what's, what's changed? That's true. Israelis really do buy uh, online a lot. But if we look at uh, what has been happening following the coronavirus pandemic, there was an uptick in the purchase of food online. Clothing has increased sevenfold. That's really huge. People were buying more books, office supplies, which also experienced a threefold increase. Electronic appliances, which have increased 3.5 times, and footwear. Um, so these are the most uh, purchased items. Interesting. All right. Now, over the weekend, we saw business owners actually protesting in Rabin Square in Tel Aviv against the government uh, and their closures. Is the government planning additional financial relief to, to support small business owners? Because uh, we're seeing that there are a lot of issues. 
Yeah, there are, there are a lot of issues, but I think that um, the government is really uh, has, has given more than it actually can because now if you look at reports, the, the government is thinking of how to pay for the 80 billion shekel aid pack. Uh, we're talking about uh, downsizing and budget cuts across all ministries. We're talking about cutting uh, the salaries of people working in the public sector. So it doesn't look like they'd be able to, to give more even if they want to give more. Mm. Now, it's about these small businesses and, and online shopping, maybe they can meld in some way. How can small businesses uh, or independent contractors, et cetera, who are struggling right now maybe cash in on the online wave if they aren't already? Yeah, so uh, a lot of um, um, online platforms like uh, Zap, for example, they provide uh, small businesses with the opportunity of, of opening a virtual store uh, in, using their platform. So a lot of small businesses can take advantage. And just to be present there, and a lot of times you can also be in contact with your clients either via WhatsApp or a uh, online store that you open. It doesn't have to be very fancy. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing right now is just to be present online and to be in contact with your customers to show them that you're there and that you sure. care. All right. Now, I, I want to move back for a second to the aid uh, because, again, we, we discussed a lot of issues of simply getting the aid, not necessarily whether or not it's, it's been made available by the government, but whether or not small businesses can actually access it. Do you know, that, uh, do you know if this issue has been fixed or streamlined at, at all? Yes, well, there, there were issues, and uh, yes, the government is making more effort in order to accommodate. There are a lot of uh, people turning to different government sources, especially the, uh, the uh, tax authority. Um, and the people who haven't gotten any aid, the, the business people, are usually the ones who weren't entitled to it. But those mm -hmm. who were entitled to it are getting it, and fairly quickly, honestly. Wow. And that was a bit surprising. Yeah. Well, it's a pleasant surprise, and uh, doctor, thank you so much for being with us. It's a pleasure. In other news, residents living just outside the Israeli settlement of Itzhar are now condemning the Israeli government following the morning demolition of several illegal buildings there. Two have been arrested for obstruction as hundreds of Israeli security members have now demolished six structures in the outposts of Kipasurga, Tkuma, and Kumiori. And at least three of the buildings were serving as family homes. But all six had been built without proper permits, and two of the buildings had even been built illegally in Area B of the West Bank, which is under Palestinian control. The residents who built them, one of whom was arrested, believed that by building in Palestinian territory, Israel would not be able to intervene. But Israeli courts have ruled that Israel can demolish homes built illegally by Israelis, even if they're in Area B. And residents of the settlement, though, have condemned the demolitions, especially amidst the coronavirus pandemic. And legal activist Itamar Ben-Gvir now says that he's petitioning the High Court of Justice to stop demolitions in the future. Moving on, Israeli Yom HaShoah, or Holocaust Memorial Day, has now come to an end. And in the midst of the COVID pandemic, it's been marked with dozens of online survivor testimonies and ceremonies, including a totally virtual March of the Living. But several other religious and national holidays are coming up, and not everything can be done online. The Muslim month-long holiday of Ramadan begins Thursday, April 23rd, and Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu has already discussed regulations to keep coronavirus from taking advantage of the celebrations. Prayers in mosques are all set to be canceled, for example, and similar to Passover, evening iftar meals where Muslims break their daily fasts will be limited to the nuclear family. Likewise, a nightly lockdown or curfew may be established to maintain compliance. Then, in the first for the nation, the Israeli cabinet has announced that next week's Memorial Day and Independence Day will be quiet affairs as well. On Independence Day, there will likely be lockdowns, and the annual military flyovers and parties will all be canceled too. Then, normally on Memorial Day, nearly 1.5 million Israelis flock to the cemeteries. But explaining that this has the potential to be a coronavirus bomb, the cabinet is set to close all of the cemeteries and set up roadblocks along the way to them. That being said, Defense Minister Naftali Bennett says that while he hopes people will opt to stay home, quote, a bereaved father is not going to be physically stopped from visiting a cemetery on Memorial Day. At least 62% of the Israeli public supports the brand new Unity Coalition. This according to a brand new survey released by Israel's Channel 13 News. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Knesset Speaker Benny Gantz announced the signing of a deal just earlier this week, in line with earlier promises to form an emergency government against the coronavirus. 
and only 22% of Israelis are opposed. The poll shows that support is a bit skewed to one side, however, with 80% of Netanyahu's Likud party voters in support against just 57% of voters for blue and white. And similarly, 41% of Israelis think that Netanyahu will break the rotation agreement. This does align with how half of Benny Gantz's blue and white parties split away to the opposition, though. They accuse Gantz of defrauding his voters and abandoning his policies in favor of sitting with an alleged criminal who will undermine the courts, referring to Netanyahu. And leading the charge is former blue and white party number two, Yair Lapid. Lapid is in line to take up the head of the opposition now, and as such is vowing to fight the new government until its collapse. New government officials reject the accusations, and blue and white MK Chili Tropel says the new government will not push any laws allowing Netanyahu to avoid the High Court of Justice either. There are petitions against Netanyahu creating a coalition while under indictment and speaking with Israeli army radio, Tropel says that if the courts decide to move against Netanyahu, then they will respect that decision, possibly even returning to elections. Blue and white will have veto power over most legislative and policy decisions, so this is a promise that Benny Gantz can stand on. Still, while acknowledging criticisms of the deal, Gantz says it would be unthinkable to go back to elections amidst the pandemic, and that they had to put the common good before their personal good. And two-thirds of the country seem to agree. On a related note, the right-wing Yamina party has yet to join the coalition, but Prime Minister Netanyahu and Yamina party chairman Naftali Bennett are set to meet today. And here to discuss is Jeremy Saltan, political strategist and director of English operations with Yamina. So, Jeremy, first of all, thank you for being with us. Why is Yamina holding out? It's great to be with you, Aaron. Uh, look, we want to be a part of this government. Whether we will be a part of this government or not is going to be determined by the answer to two questions. And that's exactly the stuff that we expect to come up within the meeting between Netanyahu and Bennett, as well as what we would hope will be the coalition teams of Likud and Yamina uh, meeting later tonight. And those two questions are, number one, in what direction is this coalition headed? And number two, what is our influence going to be within this coalition. Now, why are those two questions important? Well, the agreement that was signed between Benny Gantz and Benjamin Netanyahu talks a lot about what happens with both of those parties. But we do not have coalition guidelines. We don't know what the position of the government is on the majority of issues that usually come to bear within an actual government. And of course, the question of influence. If we're going to be able to influence this government, obviously we're going to want to be a part of it. If we're going to be asked to join the government but have no influence, that is a very big issue moving forward. So where do you think Yamina would be better off, within the coalition or within the opposition as of now? Well, my expectation is, is that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu wants to maintain the right-wing bloc of 59 MKs. I don't see any real benefit uh, for him going ahead and trying to split it. I think, obviously, whenever you're thinking about the right-wing bloc, of course, Naftali Bennett, Ayelet Shaked, Bitzel Smotrich, these are the big names that you think of when you think of the right-wing bloc. So I do think that when it comes down to those two questions, what we should see is Likud saying that they will move this coalition in the direction that Yamina can feel comfortable with, not just within uh, issues that have to do with sovereignty, but also with additional issues. And in terms of us having influence, I assume that he will offer us a good deal on the table in which that influence will be seen based on what it is that is offered. Now, do you, do you think that there's any chance of Yamina splitting up similar to how Blue and White split up, uh, where certain members of Yamina would defect to the coalition and leave other members of Yamina behind? I've read uh, these reports in the press, uh, like yourself, that there are supposedly certain elements within Yamina that are considering breaking off and joining the coalition uh, without us. I, I just don't see something like that actually happening. I don't think that after everything that has gone on over the last year and a half and all the lessons that have been learned, that we're going to see um, Yamina go the same way of uh, the Labor Gesher uh, merits list sure. or the blue white list. I think Yamina will remain whole and will either join or not join the government as one block. 
All right, Jeremy, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Aaron. All right, now returning to the coronavirus, top health ministry official Professor Sigal Sadetsky warns that a second, more dangerous spike in infections will hit in May. Unless, of course, Israelis take social distancing more seriously. But luckily, it looks like Israel could have at least an early warning sign. And it's coming from our toilets. LTV's Nittany Manson has the scoop. That's right. Israel has now started to estimate the rate of COVID-19 infections on a society-wide scale by surveilling our sewage. And if the plan works out as intended, then the government would have an early alarm bell for sudden spikes in the virus. Currently, Israel is struggling to increase the number of daily coronavirus screenings, but even when testing upwards of 12,000 people per day, asymptomatic carriers are going unseen. And we now know that anywhere from 25 to 70 percent of virus carriers are asymptomatic. So according to the health ministry's Dr. Itai Bar-Or and media reports, we can simply test the amounts of virus shed in wastewater and predict how many people are infected regardless of symptoms. And apparently with initial tests showing very promising results, over a dozen teams around the world are trying out the same thing. Now, it's often been said that art reflects life, but so then what does art look like when under quarantine and lockdown? Here with us now with the answer is Michel Kishka, an award-winning Israeli cartoonist who challenged his students at the Bezalel Academy of Arts to illustrate life amidst the coronavirus pandemic. Now, thank you again, of course, for being with us. Now, please tell us a little bit about your students and how they chose to reflect uh, their experiences and their illustrations. Okay, nice. Uh, you know, when we had to to enter into confinement, all of us, six weeks ago, uh, we in Bezalel, the teachers in the Art Academy in Jerusalem, we find a way or ways to keep in touch with the student because we could not know how long it would last. So I, I suggested uh, my classes to go on cartooning on the, on the corona uh, pandemic just to, to, to stay in the run, just for the fun of it, not as a part of our program. And uh, some of the students, uh, found that was a good opportunity uh, because cartooning on the situation helps you overcoming your hard feelings because humor is a, a sort of way to find uh, some oxygen in this, uh, uh, let's say, stressing situation. So I, some of the students sent me works. I sent them back the comments in a very simple, primitive way, by mail, simply by oh. mail. And it appears to be a very practical way to function. Um, and, yeah, and these images are, are amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's very simple, you know. You don't need uh, so many Zoom and so many Skype and so many technology. You can, like in the old times, simply send the mail of the work that you scan or send it with your smartphone. It's very easy, and, and that was a way also for me to keep in touch with them and to check what is their situation, because they all lost the jobs that they had. Mm -hmm. Some of them had to go back to their families and to leave the, the students' dormitories, that's not a simple situation. And I think that the cartooning was a help for them yeah. and for other classes too, because other teachers did different things with their classes. So now, are you teaching any other, other classes right now, norm, you know, as normal or as close to normal as possible, painting, drawing, etc.? Yes, you know, the confinement was just before Pesach, and uh, it gave the academy some time to, to prepare to coming back to to learning by, by Zoom this time. And so there was a sort of decision what is possible to go on doing and creating on Zoom and what is not, what is what needs interaction mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a workshop with physical presence. Well, I know how important a studio environment can be and, and I think it's just amazing that you guys are, are continuing to provide that in, in any way. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much. All right, now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight will be clear and comfy at 64 degrees Fahrenheit or 18 degrees Celsius. Then tomorrow should be partly cloudy and with a high of 72 or 22 Celsius. And now before we go, let's take a look at what's going viral in Israel. I wish everybody was just a little bit more distanced, but this is still an amazing scene from uh, South Tel Aviv's Jaffa area. And uh, what a party. All right. 
That is it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.55 shekels to the American dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube and Roku TV pages. I'm Aaron Porras. Thank you so much for watching.